Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. Howard University is widely regarded as a leader in STEM fields, and our College of Medicine is respected around the world for its legacy of training competent and compassionate physicians to serve the medically underserved. My guest on this program has been helping to build on that legacy over the past year, guiding the future of the anatomy department through strategic planning, faculty recruitment and retention, and growth of research funding. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guest today on the journey is Dr. Byron Ford, the Chair of the Department of Anatomy, and the M. Wharton Young Endowed Chair in Anatomy. Dr. Ford, welcome to the journey. Thank you for having me. So it's been a year since you've uh, been here at the university, but we, I want to go back a bit uh, to your more formative years, and maybe you could tell us a bit about your family and the town you grew up in. Sure. Uh, I'm from Grambling, Louisiana, which is the home of Grambling State University, a, a well-known HBCU. And so uh, my normal was uh, seeing uh, black people in power. So the mayor was African-American, the, the pres college president, the deans, all of those uh, folks were African-American. So seeing black people in power was my normal. And uh, I grew up there, uh, the oldest of four boys. Uh, and my uh, parents had large families. My father had 13 brothers and sisters. And my mother had uh, 24, 23 brothers and sisters. So same parents, huge reunions. <laughs> <laughs> I can absolutely imagine. So what was your schooling like? And, and what got you interested or on the road to, to science? Did it start early at elementary school? What, what was that like? So it started early. Um, when, I remember when, when I grew up, my family uh, had us all these little books where you could put a picture and you put your report card and all those things, and I still have it. And uh, in kindergarten, I wanted to be a fireman. And then every year since, I wanted to be a doctor. And so uh, my plan was to become a medical doctor. But uh, I had an opportunity to work in a hospital as I was part of a, a physical therapy uh, uh, undergraduate plan and realized that perhaps working in a hospital was not for me. <laughs> and, and so I, I had an opportunity to do a summer research program uh, at Meharry. Okay. And so uh, when I went to that program, the, the spark hit me. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I'd applied to Meharry and other places. I'd also, also applied to medical school. And once I decided to go to Meharry to, gra to graduate school, I didn't go to my uh, interviews for medical school. That wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. So I've been on this track since then. Excellent, excellent. And, and was there a teacher in middle school, high school that you particularly remember or a class you took that really made STEM feel like it was the right thing to do? I think it was my, my high school uh, science class, my chemistry classes. And there was a connection between those classes and, uh, and Grambling at that time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the high school teachers interacted with the faculty members there. So I got a chance to be on the campus and I think that really sprung my interest in science. Right, no, absolutely. And so t tell me a bit about your undergrad experience um, in a little more detail. You said you were kind of in a physical therapy uh, type program, but obviously you had a good opportunity. Those summer programs um, at the HBCU as we told, but how robust um, was your mentoring and, uh, uh, um, and what role it played in your choices when you were in undergrad? So as an undergrad, I think the, the, the mentoring, I think I was fortunate that I had a mentor who during her summers went to Meharry and did research in, in the lab at Meharry. Mm. I, I wish that there were perhaps more opportunities there for uh, folks like myself who really wanted to get into the research because the research was good and I think they were very, very uh, uh, great in guiding us towards research. But I think there wasn't enough active research going on at the institution, which is part of the reason why I'm so excited to be here at Howard. And so um, because of that, I was introduced to the person who would become my mentor at Meharry. And so a lot of these mentorships are what guide you to the next step. And each step that I've gone along has guided me to the next one. And so I'm still uh, closely connected with all of those previous mentors. Excellent. So let, let, let's dig into your graduate program and you see what, which graduate program you enrolled in and then we'll get into some details about your research activity. So, so I, I, I enrolled in the, the a program at Meharry Medical College. And it was because my mentor, uh, Jim Townsell, uh, was someone who I saw as a second father figure type. And that's sort of what I needed at that point in my career. At that time, there were other um, 
colleges that were trying to get me to go into their uh, uh, PhD programs. These were uh, PWI schools. I know uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tulane, which was in my state, was trying to convince me to come, even though I made the decision to go to uh, Meharry. And I went there and visited with them, but when it came down to it, Meharry is where I wanted to be because that was the type of mentoring that I wanted. Excellent. And so what, what, what type of research did you embark upon at that time for your thesis, et cetera? So this was a, a neuroscience lab. And mm -hmm. so neuroscience was one of the prominent areas at the time when I was coming up. Uh, shortly after that was the, the decade of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I learned a lot about how the brain functions and it's guided me through everything that I'm still doing today as, as, as a neuroscientist. Right. And so once you finish your PhD, uh, where did your career take you at that point? So, so after my PhD, uh, my graduate advisor at the time introduced me to the person who would be my next graduate advisor, who was the, the chair of neurobiology at Harvard Medical School. And it was interesting because he, he really suggested that I should work with this particular individual because he thought I would get a good mentoring experience. It wasn't necessarily the research area that I was interested in, but uh, I, I followed his guidance and went into that lab. And so what I realized was that it was a completely new field to me. And, and I went there and I had to, in essence, learn a different area that I was not doing during graduate school. And uh, at that time, they had just discovered this uh, new molecule that I'm still working with, and they were looking at how it interacts with the nerve muscle uh, development. And because it was a new molecule, there, we would have these big lab meetings with all of his lab folks, and there were a lot of things that I did not understand at the time. But I, I remember I, I gave myself one permission, and that was I could not know something once, but I would not know, I would not, not know it twice. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and so once, once I heard it, I, uh, going forward, I would make sure that I would never not know that again. And read all the literature about that. So when people came to ask about it, all the lab came to me because they knew I knew the whole field. At that right. time. Okay. And, and probably give us the specifics of what you were researching while you were in your grad program and then probably the specifics of what uh, you were researching once you joined that particular, the, the next lab. So in my uh, graduate lab, we were looking at how uh, neurons um, or nerve cells interact with each other. And so we used a, a model called a horseshoe crab. And we were looking for a specific transporter in uh, nerve cells that would take back a, uh, a particular uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is broken down and its precursor is taken back up. And so we were looking at how that functions because no one had discovered uh, the particular transporter that it works with. And so we were looking for that. Uh, we, we did not complete those studies and find out what that transporter was when I was in graduate school. But it did help to guide me to the next step that I would be looking at uh, in my postdoctoral lab, which interestingly was not a neuroscience project. It, because I was looking at a particular type of receptor in, um, in brain cells called a, an acetylcholine receptor, mm -hmm. we started looking at, in my research, how that was functioning in the heart. Mm -hmm. And part of that was because there were knockouts for this molecule called neuregulin that this lab had discovered and they all died as embryos from heart failure. And so my role was to look at why the heart was not developing properly so that these animals did not live. And when you say knockout, meaning animals that did not have the gene. Yeah, so they were genetically engineered so that they didn't make, make that particular right. gene. Right, uh, that's fascinating. So you get to the postdoc lab, you're working more on the impact on the heart versus the brain, but obviously learning a lot of techniques. Mm -hmm. um, how long were you in that lab for your postdoc research activity, and then what did you do after that? So when I, when I, I, I joined uh, Jerry Fishbach's lab at Harvard, mm -hmm. I was there with him for three years, and then he left to become director of the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke here at the NIH. And so I moved with him, and I was there with him for uh, a subsequent two years. And there, with all of the work that I was doing, uh, in, in neuroscience in, in my graduate studies, and then the work that I was doing in the cardiovascular system in my postdoctoral studies. In 2000, he actually got another job, and he <laughs> moved to become the dean of the medical school at Columbia. And so I had a choice to either go with him or I could start to look for my 
first faculty position. And I wanted something more independent. And so an oppor opportunity came for me to go to Morehouse School of Medicine. And I, I went there and I wanted to find somewhere where I could combine that expertise in neuroscience and cardiovascular physiology. Mm -hmm. And so stroke was the natural marriage. So it's, a, it's of course, a, a, a disorder of blood flow to the brain. And so, and, and what happens is brain cells die. And so I wanted to understand both the, the vascular side as well as the, the neuronal side to see how we could develop a treatment for stroke. Right, oh, that's, that's excellent, fascinating. So you got to Morehouse, um, kind of back in the HBCU home since Grambling was yes. your, your, I would say, your surrogate mm -hmm. uh, institution. What was it like moving from high-powered lab um, at Harvard, then the um, National Institutes of Health, and then coming to Morehouse, where very talented people, but probably a very different circumstance. It was a different circumstance, and I think the, the, the biggest uh, circumstance, as we know, are related to resources. And so I, I knew going to uh, Morehouse School of Medicine that they would not have the resources that they would have at NIH or Harvard. But, but because of the connections I made there, I had access to them. So, right. And especially in this day and age, a lot of what we do is, is computational. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to set up collaborations. It's easy to send samples between different labs. So it wasn't a big problem mm -hmm. for me to continue that level of research uh, while I was at Morehouse School of Medicine. Okay. And then in terms of students and being able to mentor and influence students, what did you find in terms of, uh, you know, how interested were students in this area or in research in general? I think there was a lot of interest. And, and I think that the whole journey supported what, what I believed before is that there are some very talented students, particularly African-American students, mm -hmm. who see coming to a place like uh, Morehouse School of Medicine or Meharry or Howard as their first choice. These are not students who are looking for a backup school. And, and they can get a good education. And, and so we, I think, at Morehouse School of Medicine attracted a lot of good students who, who were interested. And I think being at Harvard was, was very helpful in understanding that we have students that are just as good as, or better than those students, and we have a whole spectrum of students. And so I was down the hall from, from three people that won Nobel Prizes. And, and the best thing that I learned when I was there is that I can do that. Yeah. And so, and, and if I put my mind to it, I can do it. And, and this is what I always tell my, my students in my lab. Mm. This is one degree of separation from you, maybe two. Right. You can do this. That's absolutely right. How long um, was your uh, tenure at Morehouse? <clears throat> so I was there for 14 years. Okay. So I um, was there, I uh, went up the ranks to full professor. And uh, in my last two years there, I was uh, the vice chair of the department. Okay. And so uh, my, my mentor there, Peter McLeish, who's mm -hmm. the department chair, yeah. uh, supported me in that. I think he, he must have seen something in me and, and <laughs> wanted me to be the vice chair. And then for a year, uh, he went on a, a, a mini sabbatical. Yeah. And so I was the interim chair while he's away, while he yeah. was away. I'm very familiar with him. I know he does uh, neuroscience um, uh, research as well. I actually had an opportunity to talk to him about trying to recruit him here, to be quite honest. Oh, wow. I was, I was fascinated by his work and uh, his accomplishments um, there. So you clearly had an excellent mentor um, in him. So, you know, uh, you served a year in that role and you were the vice chair. And, you know, what were you thinking in terms of career-wise? There are lots of younger people, graduate students who listen to uh, this program and uh, one of the things we try to do, so really explain to them what are these, you know, kind of, uh, I would say, uh, the choices in your journey that make you pick one or the other and why. And so what was your thought process at that time in terms of what, what you were going to do next? Well, my, my thought process was that I absolutely did not want to be a chair. Right. right. <laughs> so, so here I am. So I, I did not want to be a chair at that time. Um, being a chair, uh, you have to pay attention to everyone else's issues and you kind of in some ways have to put what you're doing on the back burner. And so my research was still extremely important to me. And we were at the point where the, 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 the compound, the neuregulin that we talked about previously, mm -hmm. has, we've completed the preclinical studies to the point where we're ready to start moving towards clinical trial. Right. And unfortunately at, at Meharry, I mean at Morehouse School of Medicine, we didn't have the, the clinical trial expertise or the partnerships that I could develop with the clinical side in order to get it there. And so uh, 
the opportunity came uh, with uh, University of California Riverside School of Medicine and I have a wonderful uh, clinical partner there who's a, a stroke neurologist and we've actually formed a company and we're moving that towards clinical trials. So at that time I was sort of guided by my desire to move the research forward yeah. but uh, I guess over, over time I start to move more in an administrative role in addition to that. Understood. So you get to Riverside, and what year was that that you got to Riverside? That was 2015. Okay. So you get to Riverside, you have the clinical partner, you're trying to set up the trials. Um, tell me about that environment. What was different about it? Um, you know, what helped spur your research um, there? Uh, and what about it as you look back? You know, you would say to someone as you take that kind of food, that next leap, you know, what were the critical factors? Well, I, I think, uh, again, it, it comes down to resources. Uh, the University of California is, is arguably the, the, the biggest and the leading college system in the world. And so in addition to the resources at uh, UC Riverside, I was near UC Irvine, UC San Diego, all of these different areas where there was the opportunity to collaborate with people mm -hmm. and uh, people who were in my field. There was also opportunity to, to build an intellectual property uh, portfolio. But uh, that actually happened when I was at Morehouse School of Medicine. So when I was there, I was able to file, uh, we have now eight issued patents mm -hmm. for our compounds and, and versions of our compound for the treatment of stroke. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, they decided that they needed to bring down their patent portfolio because it gets uh, fairly expensive. Yeah. And so they created the opportunity where uh, faculty members could uh, have their patents released to them. So I now own those patents. Excellent. And I have a company with my brother and, and my uh, partners at UC Riverside. And so I think a, a lot of opportunities to move things forward in the intellectual property realm. Absolutely, that, that's fantastic. And so, you talk a little bit more about your time at Riverside, a student body. Riverside, um, the undergrad um, portfolio is very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, when I look at Howard's graduation rate for Pell Grant students, Riverside is always up there with us. As a matter of fact, they rank very well in terms of not just the volume of students they take who are Pell Grant, but in terms of graduating them. How many of those students were showing an interest in a PhD? And what about that pipeline you thought was interesting at a, it's a PWI, I guess, but it's mm -hmm. significantly minority serving uh, institution? Well, and, and that was uh, one of the strengths of, of UC Riverside is, is it is a federally designated uh, minority serving institution. Mm -hmm. And so they have a large uh, underrepresented minority, serve, uh, minority uh, population which does not translate very well to the graduate school. So, so while I was there, I was the, the director of the graduate program in biomedical sciences. And so the undergraduate uh, uh, underrepresented population is maybe around 50, 60 percent, mm. whereas in the graduate school is about 10 to 15 yeah. percent. So they're not getting even their own students into graduate programs. And so that was something that I was working on, yeah. uh, trying to help fix when I was director of the graduate program. And so we, we did change that. I think we, we ended up with maybe 30, 40 uh, percent okay. underrepresented students. Right. Uh, not a lot of black students because the, the undergraduate population yeah. of, of black students across the entire UC system is around 3 percent. So it's really hard to get students. So w what were some of the things that you learned? What, what were the barriers for those students um, coming to the graduate school? And what types of um, techniques did you put in place to overcome that? So I, I actually had a grant from NIH, which was a, a partnership between UC Riverside and one of the, the local community colleges. Mm -hmm. And part of that was because uh, UCR got in trouble from the state because we weren't bringing in enough uh, community, community college students. Mm -hmm. And so when I first got the grant and I went over to uh, Riverside City College and I, and I just talked to the students and I asked them, I said, what, how many of you have UCR as your first choice to go to? Zero, even though we are three miles away from them. Okay. And primarily it was because they didn't feel welcome. Mm. They didn't feel that it was an inviting uh, environment. Yeah. They didn't even think that they could be allowed. Some didn't think they were allowed to go onto the campus. And so we had to fix that and, and get them to realize that we were a welcoming place. Oh. And so when we had, we had a, a weekly seminar series that we had, uh, with, with uh, the school, and 
we took our folks and we went over there as opposed to saying you all come over here yeah. and and they got a chance to, we brought all of our transfer people over there admissions right. people uh, oh. uh, uh, pipeline program people all went over to meet them and at the end of the program and we just got renewed for another five years uh, just prior to me leaving 100 percent of the students all transferred to UC Riverside wow and it's just a matter of you want to make people feel welcome yeah. you want them to, to feel special and feel like they are really, really good students. Yeah, well, that, that, that's an incredible <clears throat> outcome, especially when we look at um, the number of <clears throat> underrepresented students in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, it's a major challenge. So you were against being a chair. <laughs> um, and obviously, we recruited you, recruited you very aggressively to join us. What has changed your mind about the chair position? I think this process changed my mind. Uh, even when I was at uh, UC Riverside, uh, I, I, b before I left, I was the, the associate dean for medical education. And so uh, I oversee the, the, the preclinical medical curriculum. Mm -hmm. And my dean asked me if I was interested in being chair. Right. As, as a career direct, uh, direction, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I do not want to be a chair. Right. But, uh, Coincidentally, the, I was reached out to by a search firm about this chair position at Howard. And I think I still didn't want to be a chair at that point, but, but I was really enamored by Howard. Yeah. And so I said, okay, might as well uh, take a look at it. And as I started to, to talk to people and, and realize some of the opportunities, it became very, very interesting to me to become a chair. Right. And as you said, you know, part of it is it can take away from your own work, uh, obviously your work has matured, so you probably felt more comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. Since you've been here in the role, what has surprised you the most, um, both you know, good and bad? I would say the, the most surprising thing is that despite the fact that Howard is a, a big school with a, lot, with, a large student, with a large student body, that it seems like a family. It, people are, are, are very friendly. Uh, now that COVID's over, there's a, a lot of places where I get lots of hugs and, and things like that on campus. So the, the biggest surprise has been just the, the, the camaraderie. And mm -hmm. I expected that coming here, I, I sort of girded myself to get a lot of pushback from some of the things that we had talked about that needed to get done. And, and so far, I think I'm still in the honeymoon period. Let's, <laughs> let's hope that stays that way. Uh, that's a long honeymoon period on this campus. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a long time. What are some of the initiatives that you have? And obviously, you're also supporting uh, the dean's office around research as well. So, uh, I wanted to you know speak to our listeners a bit about both of those things: the um, how you're supporting the dean's office and what the department of anatomy is particularly focused on today, and and what you're focused on in terms of bringing in students and giving them the best experience. So, so for for anatomy, uh, one of the things that I've learned in in talking to uh, folks here and folks who've graduated is that anatomy seems to be one of the more popular courses that all medical students take. Right. And so we want to, to keep that. We want to uh, bring in, because we've lost some faculty, so we want to bring in new faculty. We want to be innovative. So we want to be able to bring technology in because that's how students learn now. Yep. And so we're really pushing to make sure that we have technology and sort of interactive teaching uh, in anatomy. Uh, it, one of the challenges of, of and, and you all were, were honest with me about, about anatomy, is that there was perhaps a, uh, because they had multiple uh, interim chairs and there, were, there was not the same vision yeah. in the department. But uh, one of the things that, what, that I found is that if you work with folks and, and create a, a, a unified vision, mm -hmm. that everybody is moving forward with that. And so I think we've done that. I think I can honestly say I have a good working relationship with every single faculty and staff member in the department. Excellent. And so I think, we're, I think we're in good shape there. Good, and in the yeah. dean's office? So, so, so that was that was part of the discussion that that we had, uh, and and I had with with the previous dean who who brought me on, is that I knew that there were some challenges with regards to research, and in order for me to be able to support some of the changes that would happen, I would need to have an ear in the dean's office, and so I I requested that that I would have a a, a dean's position in addition to the chair's position yeah. that would allow me to be at the table when there are discussions about research. And so when 
Howard offered me a chair spot and also the to become assistant dean for research and graduate studies. Yep. I mean, you've given me everything that I want, <laughs> sort, of the, sort of the dream job. Excellent. And and with that, we've made some changes in, in a short period of time. So one of the things that happened in, in 2020 is that the, the, the provost reviewed all of the graduate programs across Howard and they received different designations. And so there are six graduate programs in the College of Medicine, one for each of the departments. Mm -hmm. And so they were scheduled for reorganization and consolidation. And, and I think it, it, it was needed because they were very small, uh, sort of, in, in some cases, unfunded graduate programs. And so the first job that I was given in that role was to consolidate the six graduate programs into a unified graduate program in biomedical sciences. Yep. And so, uh, we put together a working group of faculty. We wanted this to be ground up. Uh, it has now been uh, approved by, the, by that group. Uh, the chairs are on board, the dean's, on, the dean's on board, the dean of the graduate school is on board. And so we're expecting to have that presented to the board at their next meeting and we'll be ready to go in 2024. So I'm excited about that. I think that is gonna be a, a place where we can attract a lot of ex exciting students because yeah. there will be a lot of innovation, there will be all of the different areas of biomedical sciences, there will be uh, engineering that we'll collaborate with, there will be uh, uh, AI that we'll be uh, incorporating into the curriculum, uh, data science. So there will be a lot of in innovative things that will be coming out of that program. Great. So as we wrap, uh, one, my last question is always the same question to my guests. You've been here a year now, you, you've created you know, a lot of value, uh, great programs, anatomy is strong. For the undergrad student who's listening to this and wants to come to Howard to do their PhD in biomedical sciences, why Howard? Interestingly, I had this conversation with the director of the Carr Scholars Program yesterday. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he had indicated that in their program, and these are some of the, the brightest STEM students in the country, right. and not a lot of them are, are coming to our graduate programs. And so what I will tell them is that we will give you the best education that you can get. One of the things that we will do is we will go to them and let them know that we want them and that they're welcome. We want them to go out and compete and find other places and when they've done all that, still choose Howard hey. as their number one choice. And so we're gonna make that happen. We're gonna make them want to be here. And when they're here, I will have, we, I and the faculty will have a vested interest in them being successful. Excellent, I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. My guest today was Dr. Byron Ford, Anatomy Department Chair, and the M. Wharton Young Endowed Chair in Anatomy at Howard University. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.